Hi everyone, we're going to give it another minute to let people join and then we'll get started. Please be sure that the opening slide is showing on your screen. Everyone's on mute, so if you're having any difficulties, please let me know by sending a message to the panelists on the chat feature and we'll get everyone settled in. We're going to get started now. Welcome everyone, my name is Grace Finlay Golden and I'm with Foothold Technology. Today's webinar is on supportive housing and Medicaid, part two of a series with CSH. I would like to start by extending big thanks to CSH for partnering with us. We have a lot of information to get through today, but we'd like to answer as many questions as possible. So if you have a question at any point during the presentation, please let our speakers know by sending a chat message through the chat feature on your screen. I'll now turn it over to Paul Rossi, David Bucciferro, Sue Augustus, and Julie Nelson. Thanks, Grace. Good afternoon, everyone. We're happy to welcome you to the second webisode in our Medicaid and Supportive Housing series. And like Grace said, Foothill Technology and CSH are, can, are excited uh, to continue our partnership around supportive housing. Just a little background on who we are. Let me advance here. Foothill Technology was founded in 2000. They offer a web-based software for human service providers, it's called Awards, and with the goal of creating a working environment in which our clients are liberated from the constraints of information management and are free to focus on their mission. CSH is the national leader in supportive housing, focusing on person-centered growth, recovery, and success that contributes to the health and well-being of the entire community. As Grace mentioned, uh, these are our presenters. My name is Paul Rossi, as Grace said, and I'm the Director of Client Services here at Foothold. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Sue Augustus, a Senior Program Manager at CSH, David Bucciferro, a Senior Advisor here at Foothold. And also today we're joined by Julie Nelson, a Senior Program Manager at CSH. Julie, Sue, and David bring years of experience navigating the world of Medicaid and supportive housing. And I think that you'll appreciate the insight they bring into what can be a very complicated and sometimes confusing world. On today's presentation, I'll walk us through a quick recap of our first episode, or webisode we're calling them. Sue will take us through some highlights from a CSH resource called Summary of State Action, Medicaid and Housing Services. Julie will share a look at a pilot program in Illinois, and David will wrap up with some guidance on how to think about managing data in a Medicaid environment. We'll save some time for Q&A at the end, so if you have questions, like Grace said, please go ahead and type them into the chat window. So in our first webisode, we took a broad look into the basics of Medicaid, Medicare, and supportive housing. So I wanted to share some highlights from that. So initially, we discussed the differences between Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid, of course, is a federally supervised and state-administered partnership that provides primary, acute, and long-term care to services, or long-term care services, rather, to individuals and families that meet specific income, resource, and other requirements. Medicare is a health insurance program operated by the federal government through the Social Security Administration. And different than Medicaid, income is not a consideration for Medicare, and participants may also pay a premium, deductible, or co-payments under Medicare. Medicaid expansion, under the Affordable Care Act, it allows states to expand Medicaid eligibility to uninsured adults and children whose incomes are at or below 138% of the federal poverty level, we noted that not all states have expanded Medicaid services. In many respects, what guides our, converse, our conversation today is the idea that access to safe, quality, affordable housing and the supports necessary to maintain that housing constitute one of the most basic and powerful social determinants of health. Given that Medicaid is a federal program administered by the states, 
a Medicaid state plan is the agreement that, that sort of lays out uh, the agreement between the state and the federal government uh, describing exactly how the state will administer its Medicaid program. When a state's planning to make a change to its program policies or the operational approach, the state sends a state plan amendment to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services for review and approval. States also submit uh, state plan amendments to request permissible program changes, make corrections, or update their Medicaid uh, state plans with new information. A Medicaid waiver is a provision under Medicaid law which allows the federal government to waive certain rules that usually apply to the Medicaid program. The intentions to allow individual states to accomplish certain goals, such as reducing costs, expanding coverage, or improving uh, care for a certain target group. And then there's several types of waivers, but they all fall under the authority of Section 1115 or 1915 of the Social Security Act. Then we touched on value-based care, and value-based care is a form of reimbursement that ties payments, called value-based payments, for care delivery to the quality of service provided, uh, or, or the quality of care provided, different than fee-for-service, which uh, many organizations are familiar with, and rewards providers for both efficiency and effectiveness. So value-based um, programs reward healthcare providers with incentive payments, um, like I said, for the quality of care uh, they give to folks covered within their program, and we'll see more of that under managed care. So that's, those are the highlights, essentially, from the first one. So let's get started with uh, uh, Webisode 2 uh, with Sue uh, starting us off. Sue? Thank you, Paul, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. As Paul mentioned, CSH has a document, document called Summary of State Actions, Medicaid and Housing Services, and this is a document on our website. It's updated fairly frequently as CMS um, either approves or rejects uh, state plan amendments or waivers. Uh, you will receive uh, a link to this document when we send out the recording link, so uh, never fear, you will get uh, a chance to get your own copy of the document. So states have recognized that supportive housing directed at the right population can improve health outcomes and reduce Medicaid spending. They also recognize that supportive housing services need to be financed in a way that is more sustainable than short-term government and philanthropic grants that have been the historical funding sources. So states, localities, and health services, health services payers, such as managed care organizations, are exper experimenting with ways to more comprehensively finance outreach and engagement, tenancy supports, and other tenancy sustaining services. Now, the previous administration approved a number of 1115 research and demonstration waivers to cover tenancy support services, including California, Indiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Washington. The new administration has continued its focus on tenancy support services, but they have actually focused, shifted the focus to asking states to use 1915I state plan amendments. The current administration has also continued the Innovation Accelerator program that started under the former administration. And to date, 16 states have gone through the Innovation Accelerator program, which is trying to promote integration through long-term services and supports, and really bringing housing and health partners at the state level together. So many of the states that we touch upon today will have gone through the Innovation Accelerator program, and those states are really leading the way in trying to do these new tenancy support services. Now, 1115 research and demonstration waivers are typically large scale and require budget neutrality. These take longer for CMS to approve and are usually approved for five years. And many of these are extended or amended. So states have had 1115 waivers for a long time because they have been ex expanding them and amending them and extending them. 1915I state plan amendments are shorter and more discreet and can be more easily approved by CMS. The thing with 1915I is it requires that the state ensure that all people are eligible for the services who are going to receive the services or could receive the services. The 1915I must be statewide and states really have to carefully define the population that, um, that will receive the services. They can actually target specific populations. And that allows for states to be more predictable in budgeting for the state portion of the services funding. Another feature of 1915-I's is that you don't have to meet an institutional level of care in order to be eligible for those kinds of services. Next slide, please. 
So I was gonna, I'm gonna walk through and, and tell you just about a few of the approved or pending 1115 waivers that, that we have, um, that we've seen so far. So California has a whole person care pilot and that is managed through their county health departments. Those um, whole care pilots can fund outreach and engagement and, and formation of partnerships to integrate care and tenancy support and sustaining services. The whole person care pilots expire at the end of 2020, so we only have a couple more years of those uh, running in California. California also had a health homes state plan amendment that they amended to their existing 1115 waiver. These are just uh, coming out and are managed by the managed care organization. They can fund outreach engagement, housing navigation, and tenancy support services. So the health homes um, require that people have two chronic conditions or one serious mental illness who are either homeless or could ex exit institutions with available supportive housing. Next slide, please. Other states that have approved 1115 waivers, Hawaii submitted a tenancy support amendment to their existing 1115 waiver. They've had one of those for a long time. And after a fairly lengthy process, CMS approved their tenancy support waiver in October of 2018. In order for an individual to receive tenancy support services in Hawaii, it requires that they have a behavioral health, complex physical illness, or substance use disorder diagnosis and be chronically homeless, or you could be a person living in an institution who cannot be discharged due to lack of appropriate housing, or living in public housing and at risk of eviction and has a qualifying condition or diagnosis. So again, those would be behavioral health, complex physical illness, or substance use disorder diagnosis. Hawaii has a very large homeless population, so they are really looking forward to implementing um, these services, which they hopefully will do during this calendar year. North Carolina um, had an 1115 recently approved and a portion of that created pilots that managed care organizations can apply for to provide tenancy support and the state just issued an RFP to those managed care organizations to do these pilots. Indiana had an 1115 waiver approved in the last year, and it was approved, part of that um, is approved for those with uh, substance use disorder who have treatment needs, and those tenancy supports will be provided to help those people transition to the community. Indiana is working right now on the implementation of that, so there's nothing to report as far as how it's working in Indiana yet. Next slide, please. Massachusetts um, has been a leader in tenancy supports. They've had a program called the Community Support Program for, peering, for persons experiencing chronic homelessness that is referred to as CSPEC. Uh, CSPEC has, has been around for a number of years. That allows housing providers to deliver housing-based case management services on a per diem rate basis. And providers can bill for up to 60 days prior to um, the individual actually getting into housing. CSPEC serves individuals with a diagnosed mental health disorder who, who have been without stable housing for a significant period of time. Um, the goal of CSPEC is, is to provide community-based support to increase housing stability and prevent avoidable hospitalizations. Now, um, Massachusetts is using CSPEC to base um, their, this system in their new accountable care organizations. Oregon had an 1115 approved and it has a provision that um, allows state coordinated care organizations to use housing related services. Rhode Island also had an 1115 approved, but CMS did not approve the tenancy support language in the 1115. CMS did advise them to submit the tenancy support language in a 1915I. We'll talk about those in a minute. Washington State has an 1115 approved and they are implementing it. In their waiver, they called it foundational community support or services in supportive housing. They also created a supported employment benefit in that same 1115. Washington State is implementing this statewide and I believe they have almost 900 people receiving these services currently. Next slide, please. 
So 1915I state plan amendments, um, as I mentioned, CMS advised Rhode Island to apply for a tenancy support service under a 1915I. Pennsylvania already has one approved uh, for the IDDDD population, and that was added to the menu of services available for those persons eligible for the IDDDD waiver. Minnesota has a pending 1915I that's uh, specifically on tenancy support services. And Michigan, similar to Rhode Island, had an 1115 waiver, which was not approved by CMS. But again, CMS advised them to submit the tenancy support services in a separate 1915I. So Michigan is in the process of doing that um, as we speak. Next slide, please. So it, it's important for you all to recognize that states are in different stages with, with this work from planning uh, to developing a waiver to implementing a waiver or a state plan amendment. And you all as supportive housing providers or agencies or organizations can help make this happen with the right advocacy. Next slide, please. So how do you make the case with your state Medicaid agency uh, for them to consider creating a tenancy support services benefit? One of the ways you can help um, with that advocacy is to track how many of your tenants or participants are currently covered by Medicaid or who are uninsured. And then you can create a sort of a crosswalk of what services you are providing to those tenants around outreach and engagement, around pre-tenancy, so that would be helping people get document ready, applying for apartments, looking at apartments, signing leases, understanding landlord-tenant responsibilities and lease compliance. What activities are you doing around tenancy support, such as being a good tenant, lease compliance, dispute resolution, et cetera, and then figure out what is not currently covered by Medicaid or any other funding source, but you do it anyway. And you know what I mean, that you, you do a lot of services for folks that none of your services will, will cover exactly. So this is a way to go to your Medicaid agency and say, you know what, we are doing a lot of services um, that fall under pre-tenancy and tenancy support services that we are not getting paid for. And we wish you would apply for one of these tenancy support services benefits, either through the 1115 or the 1915I. As I mentioned earlier, the 1915I is really the way that CMS is encouraging people to go right now, and it's a much quicker process. So if your state isn't doing anything, um, you might suggest that they look into a 1915I. There are many resources available. As I mentioned, the Innovation Accelerator Program has a lot of resources for states. They are actually going to do a third cohort of the Innovation Accelerator Program. So you could talk to your state Medicaid agency and say, hey, would you be interested in you know, working with CMS to try and get one of these tenancy support benefits? So the other way to do it is, um, I'm gonna be passing this to my colleague, Julie Nelson, and she's going to tell you what's happening in Illinois because Illinois had an 1115 waiver approved and Julie is helping the state think about how to implement the tenancy support services. So I'm going to turn it over to Julie and she'll tell you how it actually works um, on the ground. Great. Thanks, Sue. This is Julie Nelson and I'm on the Illinois team at CSH. So in this next part, as Sue talked about, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into our 1115 waiver. And uh, you can go to the next slide and actually go straight to the overview slide. So in Illinois, we, um, we're implementing housing tenancy supports through an 1115 waiver. As you heard Sue talk about, really states now are being encouraged to implement through the 1915I. Um, Illinois actually submitted the 1115 waiver with the previous administration, um, but it was approved during the current administration and approved in May of 2019. Within our 1115 waiver, here's kind of a, a snapshot of the housing tenancy supports pilot. This pilot is for five years. Uh, it's actually one of several pilots that are built within our 1115 waiver. So for folks in Illinois, if you're looking into this, there are actually 
nine or 10 different pilots housed within our 1115 waiver. Um, there's also varying timelines for when these pilots are being implemented. In Illinois, our housing tenancy supports um, pilot is again called the Assistance and Community Integration Services. One of the things that you will find as you're looking across the country is that the housing tenancy supports have slightly different names in each state as each state is implementing them differently. So that's something to just be aware of as you're looking across these systems. So again, in Illinois, um, we're shorthanding it with ACIS. So you might hear me say that, but that's the Assistance and Community Integration Services pilot. It includes pre-tenancy as well as tenancy supports. There are annual enrollment limits to this pilot, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Another thing with the waiver is that it um, may be implemented less than statewide. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly. Eligibility is also gonna be based on the individual. It's not gonna be based on a geographic region or, or other factors. It's really gonna be based upon each individual and their utilization history and their homeless status. The services um, that are gonna be provided um, will be provided by a set of eligible providers. It absolutely is not gonna include any subsidy for housing. Uh, as we know, Medicaid does not pay for housing or subsidies, it's only paying for the services. Another thing that Sue had mentioned previously is that with the 1115 waivers, uh, they do need to be budget neutral. And this is again gonna be a first five year pilot. In Illinois, our implementation timeline right now is July of 2019. So next slide. So again, the overarching goal of an 1115 waiver is to impact um, people's access to care. So really improving someone's ability to engage in the healthcare system, reduce um, readmission rates, reduce inappropriate ER utilization, um, reduce overdose death, and really increase someone's adherence to their treatment plan. That's the entire goal uh, for the 1115 waiver, and these are the outcomes and results that will be monitored through the span of our 1115 waiver. Next slide. So in Illinois, you can see the eligibility criteria that's been outlined within our waiver. So the health criteria is that there need to be repeated um, ER utilization or, or hospital admissions within one year. So it's four ER visits or admissions within one year, or an individual can have two or more chronic conditions. Um, those conditions are defined, you can see on your screen, um, can include but are not limited to a mental health condition, substance use disorder, asthma, heart disease, being overweight or diabetes. And then the housing criteria is another component to the waiver. So someone needs to be experiencing homelessness upon release from a setting. How it's defined is really a, a setting that would, it's a more of an institutional setting. Um, so being released from a hospital setting, an inpatient facility, a psychiatric facility, um, a youth residential program, or a, a correctional facility or correctional program. And then the, the other side to that, it can also include someone who is at imminent risk of an institutional placement. So next slide. Within the waiver, here are the enrollment um, limitations for, for Illinois. So in the first year of the waiver, that's actually right now, there's no one enrolled for the housing tenancy supports or the ACIS portion of the waiver. Year two is scheduled to start in July of 2019, and the enrollment cap for this year two is 2,250 individuals. So you can see as the years progress through all five years of the waiver, the maximum uh, enrollment is 3,750 individuals. Um, and again, this is, this is not an, a new uh, 2,800 people next year. This actually just builds. And then you can see what the rates are on the screen as well. So for the first year of implement, implementation, um, it's a per member per month rate. So as you're 
engaging in um, the Medicaid system, you might actually see PM, PM frequently. That will always mean per member per month. And that rate is $416.62. And you can see that that is projected to increase over the five year span. Uh, next slide. The waiver also includes some provider qualifications. And you can see that there are educational requirements, experience requirements, um, and then a, a skill requirement. One of the concerns in the advocate community uh, within this is we really would like to see a stronger presence for a peer component um, for the staff involved in this. So that would be really, um, that's an advocacy point that we'll be working on and others that we would really like to see more of a, a role in place for individuals um, with peer recovery specialists to really bring that uh, skill set um, in providing the service. Uh, so going on to the next slide. So for those of you in Illinois, there's a group of, of pretty active stakeholders who are working together to really inform and try and influence how this is implemented in Illinois. One thing to remember is that in Illinois, we recently had an election and there's a new administration coming in. So right now is a time where um, change is certainly possible. So stakeholders are really crafting recommendations where we're hoping to kind of make some shifts to how this is implemented in Illinois. First, we are hoping and advocating that there will be a working group um, that the state will pull together that will include supportive housing providers, advocates, um, as well as healthcare providers and managed care organizations to really inform how this is implemented in Illinois. We also want to make sure that individuals who are getting this service are, are assisted and supported in navigating the multiple types of housing that someone could potentially be eligible for. Um, we all know, working in the housing field, that there might be resources for housing through um, senior housing, through your continuum of care, perhaps through a public housing authority. And the advocate community wants to make very sure that folks really are connected to every possible housing resource, because again, we know that this is a service. Um, uh, the ACIS is all about the services, and it's not actually providing the subsidy or the housing. Another key piece of this is that the advocate community would also like to ensure that supportive housing providers who do not currently bill Medicaid can be included in the pilot and so that through either partnerships or exploring Medicaid billing opportunities that are our, our non-billing supportive housing partners will be able to participate in the ACIS pilot. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but again, looking again at the provider qualifications to really ensure that folks who are bringing lived experience, um, peer navigators, peer recovery specialists, could potentially also be a part of the provider um, of the ACIS services. In Illinois, there's a number of communities that are also focusing on projects specifically for individuals who are frequently utilizing crisis systems. Because of their, the communities that are starting to um, focus on these special populations and looking to align resources around these special populations, um, Stakeholders are really interested in making sure that the ACIS pilot is in alignment with all of these other initiatives to ensure that all of these pieces can work together to really maximize resources and maximize Medicaid billing opportunities. And finally, last but not least, uh, we also really want to recognize that Illinois is not the first state to do this. And so the, the stakeholder group has really compiled some of the best practices around the country and, and using that to craft our recommendations that we're feeding back to the state. Next slide. Uh, so CSH also recently completed a rate analysis report through the collaboration with a number of supportive housing providers throughout the state of Illinois. And we are absolutely grateful for the contributions 
of these providers. The rate analysis report was really taking a deeper dive into looking at uh, rates and sustainability based on those rates to prepare supportive housing providers for a possible scenario of, of understanding if there is a PMPM -PM rate, how that rate compares to the cost of services. So uh, going on to the next slide, I just wanted to briefly highlight here in Illinois, here's kind of a snapshot of how supportive housing providers who responded to the survey, um, how they're billing current systems or how they're funding um, their services. So you can see a number of agencies are billing through Medicaid already, but over half of the supportive housing providers that responded to this survey are not currently billing Medicaid. So again, we really wanted to reinforce and this stakeholder and advocate community is really working um, to promote with the state to ensure that our really fantastic high quality supportive housing providers who are not currently billing Medicaid are going to be included in the ACIS services and pilots. Uh, next slide. Another piece of this rate analysis report was looking at some of the rates that are used around the country for housing tenancy supports. You can see on your screen, um, there's a number of rates that we wanted to compare um, to. So Rhode Island, you can see their rates, um, LA County, the Massachusetts rate, and then Washington State. And so through the horizontal columns on your screen, you can see how respondents assessed those rates into compar in, in comparison to if it would cover the cost of their services. So the first line really is for the services only. The next line it would include the cost for um, the direct services as well as supervision of those individuals. And then the third horizontal line would be really all of the administrative overhead along with the services that go along for housing tenancy support. So you can see um, which of these rates were in better alignment in Illinois with what it costs here. Uh, next slide. So as a wrap up, um, there are a number of, of resources that we're happy to share. One, I'm, I'm happy to share the rate report. Um, a second really important piece to know for those of you who are in Illinois, right now between today and February 11th, um, that is the cutoff point for submitting comments to HFS about some of the rules that are being implemented connected to this ACIS pilot. So for folks in Illinois who would like to submit comments related to that, I will be happy to share the comments that CSH is drafting, um, as a way to, again, really inform HFS of what the, the provider community and from the supportive housing provider perspective, um, what really could be changed in these rules to uh, really improve and enhance the pilot. So at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the conversation over to David. Hi, everyone. Um... We did get a couple questions. Uh, Paul, do, would we like to handle those questions right now since we... Um, yes, sir. And again, Rebecca, are there questions to read out? I have one. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. So I'll just read it out and then we can just, uh, anyone from the panel can go ahead and answer it. Hello, I work for a homeless shelter in Maryland. We provide housing, case management, nursing, and outreach services. How would we get started with a Medicaid program for our program? And is there a huge upfront financial cost associated with this venture? Oh, this is Sue. I, I think I can respond to that. If, um, if you're asking about whether your organization could become a Medicaid biller, um, if, if that's your question, CSH has a, a training program for supportive housing providers who want to become uh, Medicaid billers or able to bill Medicaid for whatever tenancy support services your state may provide. Now, Maryland does have an, um, an 1115 waiver that had uh, 
300 people in it at one point, and I think they increased it to 600 people. So there is some history in Maryland for doing some tenancy support services. So you might check with your state to find out what they're doing and if they plan to expand that. I think it's mostly for folks who are leaving uh, institutional care, so that might not help you. But so there's two things. What is you need to find out what your state Medicaid plan has right now for tenancy support services and what they might plan to do in the future. And also, if your organization is looking to become uh, able to bill Medicaid, there would be some costs associated with that, the, the training for your staff, the, the, the admin costs, and, and getting a database and computers and things like that. That's certainly a consideration for a very small organization. But we'd be happy to um, talk to you about that if you want to email either Julie or myself. So I hope that answered your question, Cedric. Th Great. Thanks. David, off to you. Perfect. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, it, I would just I would add to what Sue said and really just recommend that you you know she mentioned this contact your state um, agency that oversees your program now and see what they might have either already started it. Sue mentioned the waiver they have, but what they might have in the pipeline. Um, and how you could get involved in that. And, and I'd also bring forward some of the information you brought forward to, that you heard today because states very frequently learn from one another. I was a state employee for 32 years and I can tell you that, that um, you know, we, we look at what other states are doing to get ideas on what you can do within um, various government programs. So I'll just remind folks that if they have any questions, either about um, what Julie or Sue said, um, or about what Paul talked about earlier, um, please just type it in the chat box and we'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, I'm gonna go through a little bit, shifting gears a little now, and this touches upon the question Cedric asked us, and it, it's really around how how can you be successful in this world of Medicaid? What what does it bring with it? What do I need to make sure that I'm able to do to be successful? We talked the last time we were all together about some of the requirements that Medicaid brings with it and that value-based payments bring with it. Um, for the most part, depending upon the size of your agency and the other services, that that you provide, it could either be just an extension of other services that you're providing, or it could be a whole new experience. Um, and, you know, through the years, I've really tried to identify what is it in agencies that are the ones that are most successful? Clearly, where you are in the country has a little bit to do with this, because not all states use Medicaid for all the services that they have provided. Um, there's different measures of success in different places. But I think across the board, these three things um, jump out as, as areas that are most involved in a successful agency. I'm not going to get into real specific details on all of these. I'm going to focus more of my attention on the data information piece. Um, but Paul, if we could jump forward. The, the really key elements that, that I have seen around success are leadership, workforce, and data. I'll, I'll substitute data and information interchangeably here, although they're two different things. Um, from a leadership perspective, and you really have to buy in from the from the leadership of that agency really has to buy into this. They have to be willing to make that culture change. Moving to a Medicaid environment does bring with it a different culture. You're measuring things differently. You're documenting things differently. You're billing differently. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to change 
the culture of who you are as a homeless program or as a housing program for recently um, discharged individuals from from an incarceration setting, for example. But it, but it does require that you do change your culture um, in many different ways, and we'll get into those. One of the other things is human resource development. You your folks are going to have to document things differently. They're going to have to use more than likely an electronic approach to documenting. Um, and so the skill set needs to be different than it was. You also really need to have quality assurance protocols in place. One of the things that, that everyone will be living with in the near future is a value-based payment approach to services. And this is really going to affect whether you're Medicare, Medicaid, or grant-based. It's really moving towards a, a value-based approach. And as Paul said earlier, that value-based approach is really a picture of your outcomes in relationship to how much it costs you to achieve those outcomes. And so you're going to need to know that information. You're going to need to know how you can bend that cost curve over time and, and, and how you can improve your outcomes using a quality assurance approach. And as I mentioned a, little, a few minutes ago, you really need to be mission driven in where you're going because this is, you want to make sure you're achieving the mission of your organization at the same time that you are providing services in a manner in which you're able to survive as an organization. From a workforce perspective, we talked a little bit about this, but you, the, the workforce is going to have a different skill set. I think we see this across the board in every disability group with every um, type of program that is operating. And this is no different for a housing program and even more, probably even more um, prevalent in organizations that are going to be adding tenancy services that they never had before. You want to make sure your, your workforce has that culture, that culture that, that change is okay, that we're going to need to do things slightly different, that the payer of these services requires things different. One of the things that I've found that really helps around the workforce is when you can get your workforce to accept what the data is telling you and utilize that data in an appropriate manner. And then lastly, it's just that adaptability. I think one of the things I've learned with Medicaid and having written a lot of state Medicaid rules is that change is inevitably going to happen at a rate much faster than makes sense to, to most normal people. And so you have to adapt to those changes. Um, the rules that come down around crossing a T and dotting an I or what signatures have to be captured. And you need to be adaptable as a workforce to, to be able to do that. Your workflows have to match that and the willingness to, to adapt to that is critical for staff. I'm gonna spend the majority of time today talking really about the data piece though. And, and the reason I do this is I think the data component, the information component is really the basis of all these other things, of, of your leadership and your workforce being able to be successful because the data is what you're going to need. Sue touched a little bit upon on this earlier, and so did um, Julie. You need to have information to make decisions. You need to have information to be able to market yourself. You need to have information so that you can go to, to the agencies that are setting the regulations and setting the rates and being able to show them why a certain amount of money is is doable and why a certain amount is not doable it it's very critical that you just don't go in there and say this is not enough money it's important that you're going to be able to go in there and say this is why it's not enough money i will tell you and 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 both sue and julie and 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 paul have mentioned this in different ways moving to a medicaid environment does have administrative costs 
it, there are going to be costs that are greater. The hope is, is that efficiency will follow and that th those costs will be covered by a, by a fair rate that you're going to um, be paid. And so let's jump into these different areas. Paul, if you could advance it. So really, when I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about five different areas. And I want you to really think of the data being your currency. Okay, I really want you to think about the fact that I have data, how can I use that data? What does this data mean for me to do certain things? And so I'm going to jump right into them from for a time perspective um, and make sure that we leave some time if anybody has additional questions. So Paul, if we could jump to the first slide, the very first thing, and, and I tell every agency that's thinking about moving to Medicaid is that you have to know what your obligations are. You, you have to know what you're responsible for, both internally and externally. And that means that what is the government asking me for? What do the funders want? What are the accreditation bodies requiring? You know, there's health and safety standards that come with Medicaid programs. There's rules around documentation that come with Medicaid programs. There's rules around um, billing that would come from Medicaid programs. And so those things are, are important for us to be able to accommodate within our program. And the only way we can accommodate them is knowing what they are. But in addition to that, you don't want to lose sight of your internal ob obligations. You know, you're a program for a reason. It's to serve the people that you, you have in your program. And so you want to make sure you're doing the very best job possible serving them. As a company, as an organization, you have a board of directors that you're responsible for and the people that work you work for. There's a responsibility for them. And so I usually go through an exercise with people when I work with them. And I'm happy to share some of this with you um, if you drop me an email or something. The, I'll go through a simple chart to be honest with you. I've got, what I do is I speak to the staff in a program. Maybe I'll talk to each individual, or you can talk to each individual, and and I sit down with them and say, this is what I need to know, or this is what you need to know, is what do you feel like you're responsible for? In your job, what are the things that you feel you have an obligation to meet? And we'll go through a series of questions, and the idea of that is let's really hone in on what you're really responsible for, how you can meet that responsibility, how you can show that responsibility has been met. Because the biggest thing you'll find as you move into government or Medicaid, Medicare type of programs is, is that you have to show how you're doing in meeting certain standards or meeting certain objectives or that you've met certain criteria for the reimbursement. And we'll go through this and we'll look at these charts and agencies will do this on a, on a you know, a, a, a periodic basis and they'll find where overlaps are. They'll find where things no longer of, of, of value and they'll make those adjustments and they really can start to hone themselves down so, they've, so they can reduce some of the administrative costs associated with this. And I will tell you, it's really important as a Medicaid provider or a Medicaid, Medicare provider to really make sure you're efficient on this part of, of what your business is doing because this is not generating the revenue. This is keeping you open from a government perspective and an accreditation body perspective. Um, but this isn't the part that's going to generate you the revenue that way. Paul, if we can move forward. So, where you really start to, to utilize that information. So now you, you, you know, you have a bunch of data and, and I'll tell you that data is just a piece of something. It's like red is a piece of data. 
a car is a piece of data. A house is, is data. But until you start putting those together, like there's a red car sitting in front of a house, do you have some information, right? That's beginning to tell you something. Now you know that in front of a particular house, there's a red car sitting there. So that you took three pieces of data, you put them together to give you information. And you're going to do this with the data that you collect. You know, whether it be through an electronic health record, whether it be through reports that the government is sending you, whether it be through some third party information, data elements you get, when you start to link that together, you start to really gain some information about what you're doing. And when you organize that information, you organize those different pieces of information, you start to provide yourself with knowledge. I'm gonna give you a little example of this, but I'm gonna use a vocational setting. Um, it pertains to housing as well. I'm only using a vocational setting because this is a agency I worked with um, just before I had left my job at New York State, um, where they were really struggling with employment. And, and they couldn't figure it out. They had two employment programs at two different locations. Both were in areas where there was high need for employees. Both of them ran the same types of services. One was doing much better than the other. And so they really started to piece, to peel back the layers of the programs until they really got the information they needed. And what they found out was that one of the programs, there was a person that was working in that program who was um, very active with the individuals who had worked in that community and knew what the jobs were in that community and had a really good understanding of that community. The other program had very good clinicians doing very good work, but they didn't have that real life experience and that made a huge difference. One program had 40%, the other had 20. And what they did was they used that information. They applied that knowledge and what they ended up doing was they split that individual between the two settings until they real, that person really taught um, people in that program Here's the kinds of jobs to look for. Here's the kinds of skill sets you need for those jobs. And they were able to move both of their programs up into the, the mid 40s to nearly 50% employment. It, it, it's a really positive way of showing that how you can take data and really use it to improve your program. And another piece that's important to understand, information is not just something that the the executive director or the bosses all look at. Anywhere you sit in your organization, information is going to be important to you. If you're, in a, if you're a supervisor, you really want to have information about the success of the people you're working, that the success of the employees you're supervising. You want to know if a certain shift is missing meds or if a certain area is not fulfilling some of the outcome expectations. You want to know which areas are doing really well. You want to know what people are interested in or not interested in participating. You know, if, if individuals are not participating in certain services, you may not want to provide those. You may, you may want to put your energy in things that people are participating in that, that are going to get you better outcomes. Clinicians, you can always improve your skill set. And the best way to do that is to know what kinds of outcomes your interventions are providing. And so it's nice to know, are the individuals I'm providing this service to, do they feel like they're benefiting from it? Are they participating regularly? All the different areas that become important. And oversight and support. You know, if you, if you have a, um, a transportation program within your housing, you know, am, am I, am I, being cost effective with my routes? Am I being cost effective in the way I shop for gas? All of those things can really make a huge difference in your success in a value-based environment. Paul, if we could jump forward. So it really involves having a dynamic management process, right? You really want to make sure that you can be informed at all times, be flexible, and readily adapt. 
this is really going to make a difference in your ability to manage in a Medicaid environment. Paul, I want to make sure. So having accessibility to this information is important. You know, we, we work with hundreds of providers, um, Paul and I, and we can tell you that one of the simplest things that you really have to help people with is knowing what information staff need to have, when they need to have it, and how to use that data. And so you really are going to want to spend a little bit of time understanding who in my organization needs to have access to what kinds of information so they can do their job better. There's a question. Do we want to take it to make yeah, sure? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that do. because we'll have a, another webisode after this or we can dive in a little bit deeper, yep. but I want to read this out to the group. Um, I work at a large CDC in a state with a 115 waiver. I have tenants in my buildings who could benefit from services provided under that waiver, but I am not and will never be a Medicaid biller. What would be a good partnership uh, for me and what criteria should I use in selecting a partner? So anyone on the panel can chime in. Uh, this is Sue. The, the first thing I would do is find out what the eligibility criteria for the services are in your state, because it could be that they're limited to people who are homeless or leaving an institution to qualify for the services. So it may be that if you have people who've been living in an apartment for a while, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't actually qualify for the tenancy support services. But having said that, you could also see if managed care providers are providing the services under the waiver, you know, figuring out who is actually providing those services and then deciding if a good, you know, a good partner should be somebody who's used to providing, you know, housing based services, you know, what's their track record? Have they been doing this? Um, those are the things I would start with. Yeah, I agree. So that, that's, that's, really finding yourself a partner that may have experience in this and is looking for additional tenants um, may be a good way to, 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 to do this. Just because we only have about two minutes left, if anyone else has any questions, you can uh, submit them into the chat or in the Q&A sections um, as we're wrapping up here. And again, we're going to send the recording around to everybody and within the next few days, and we will have a follow-up web webinar where David can kind of go dive deeper into, um, into his material. So I'm going to forward all the way to the end. Uh, we have a couple of things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we've got the CSH Supportive Housing Summit 2019 coming up in Indianapolis. Uh, the registration link is right there at csh.org forward slash summit. Uh, it's very exciting and uh, you'll get to meet us in person if you're there. Uh, and hundreds of others <laughs> as well. Uh, and then the early bird discount, I think it ends at the end of February. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Julie, Sue, do you... No. Anyway, go check it out because the early bird discount is going to expire this month. Um, and then we also had a number of resources here, uh, which I think will provide some of the answers to questions that you uh, perhaps might have had but didn't ask, um, and even some of those that you, you did ask. Um, and we'll leave this up as we go, uh, as, we, as we end. Um, but look for an announcement regarding webisode number three, and we'll certainly uh, carve more time into the presentation for David on the, on the managing data, because uh, I think that's a really important piece that folks don't uh, quite get a handle on uh, until they're deep into the presentation and uh, the questions that we had really both touched on that. And one more thing I'd like to note in the corner of the slides, uh, you'll notice that we have a hashtag voices of SH and that's our interactive um, forum on Twitter and Facebook where we share um, stories from the field, content from us and from uh, some of our partners. And we would just like to encourage everyone um, to use that hashtag um, to continue the conversation online with, with your peers in the industry. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this was fantastic. Thanks, everybody. And uh, Sue, Julie, David, thank you very much. Rebecca, Grace. Uh, and we'll uh, have this uh, bundled up and uh, send a link out to the recording uh, just as soon as it's ready. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.